Okay, uh, let's get started. Um, I am going to run off the sideboard, so if you can't see, you might want to move a little. Um, I'm going to cover some things that I introduced yesterday, but, but largely what, I'm, what we're doing today is I just want to pique everyone's curiosity. I want to hopefully <laughs> instill in you, bless you, um, just, just the desire to continually research this stuff. Um, you've heard me say this before, everything we do today we have to assess with respect to security. Um, and here I have, of course, forensics up on the board, which is actually the, the research into it. It's the digital investigation. Um, and again, I introduced that University of Albany is launching their digital forensics program this coming fall 2014. And that is a great opportunity. They, they based our, their curriculum off our two-year curriculum. Um, so everyone sitting here is just positioned in the right place at the right time to get into this. Um, so what does digital forensics require? Um, it requires a complete understanding of hardware and operating systems. Right? And this is what we need to, to do. And we need to continually research um, just to stay ahead of the bad guys, so to speak. Um, so let's see if I can get my cursor over here. Move down. OK. Um, what I'm going to start here with, with is file formats and addressing. And I, and I introduced this yesterday. So, so some of this is, of course, review. And we're not looking at this in, in great detail. Um, we haven't covered operating systems yet. And the file manager is a component of the file. Uh, file manager is a component of the operating system. But of course, in the textbook, this is covered at least or introduced in storage. So if we look at addressing, um, you know, just from our basic basic understanding of textbooks, things of this nature, you know, table of contents, indexes, what do we have? We have content and a reference. Okay, what are the two things associated with every byte? Contents and an address, a reference. Okay, so we see this as applied to the operating system and the file manager. And I asked this question sometime ago, well, yesterday or the day before. Um, how many houses could you have on a cul-de-sac if you only had a single decimal digit for addressing? So what I'm talking about here, of course, is address space. And of course, we, we discussed we could have 10 houses ranging from 0 to 9. So the range is 0 to 9. The, the, the total number of houses would be 10. If we expand this, how many houses could I have on a cul-de-sac if we had storage for two decimal digits. How many? How many houses? Okay, I have storage for two decimal digits. How many houses could I have on that cul-de-sac? Total? 100, ranging from 0 to 99. Of course, I'm numbering the first house, 0. Okay? So now, of course, the computer is in binary, and we're constrained to this, you know, byte size or word size. So let's look at this. If we reserve one byte, 2 to the 8th, for addressing, how many items can we reference? We know this, okay? How many items can we store in a byte? Or how many values can we represent in a byte? 256. The range from 0 to 255, 255 being the maximum number. And this, this of course, we're constraining ourselves to positive integers. There is, of course, a way to um, denote negative integers as well. And we will get into that right now. So we see if we reserve two bytes, 2 to the 16, we can address 65,536 items. Okay? This, of course, is, is what FAT16, File Allocation Table 16, is based on. And we did introduce FAT32 yesterday. But let's look at FAT16. If we have a 1 gigabyte USB drive, and of course this is small, okay, but we use FAT16, we cannot address the drive at the sector level. Why? Okay, we have 1 billion bytes divided by 512 yields, of course 512 is the sector size, 195,000 addresses. We would need 195 addresses, but with a FAT16 we're constrained to 65,000. So obviously I need to combine sectors into clusters so that I can have an addressable device. So in this case, I would require that I choose four sectors for the cluster. So here's a question. 32-bit addressing is still here. Of course, Apple, Apple's new iPhone is 64-bit. That was 
That was actually the most impressive thing I saw yesterday. Um, if we have four bytes for the address space, okay, so very similar to what I was just talking about, houses on a street, the cul-de-sac, four bytes, 32 bits for the address space, we can address, what, four billion items. Does it make sense to have more than four gigabytes of memory if we only have 32-bit addressing? Someone tell me. No. Why? We can't use it. We can't address. We can only address four gigabytes. So having a 32-bit machine with eight gigabytes is, is pointless, OK? Because memory, of course, is byte addressable. The smallest addressable unit in memory is the byte. Eight, and, of course, a byte is 8 bits. Now, of course, on a hard drive, storage, the smallest addressable unit is the sector, 512 bytes. Okay, but we know that. Okay, so now we're going to look at or introduce file slack, RAM slack, and disk slack. Now, as some background, whenever the operating system wants to write data to a storage device, it does it in 512 byte or sector size. So even if it's writing a small file, in this case what I choose just to keep the math easy, um, if it's writing a 12 byte file, it's going to grab 512 bytes from memory and write it to disk. So of course those 12 bytes are meaningful for the file, but it's just going to grab the next consecutive 500 bytes in memory and write it to disk, flush it to disk. What will be in that memory? Who knows? But it will contain something. Why is this important? 99.9% .9 of the users out there don't realize that they're leaving breadcrumbs, trails, on their hard drive every time they save a file. And this could even be a temporary file, an automatic save. Okay? Because whatever follows the file up to the next sector boundary is going to be written. It could be an open browser. It could be an employee on a company machine on a website that they shouldn't be on at all or during working hours, and they save a file. And it's grabbing their RAM, and it's putting it on their hard drive. And you can find that information. In a minute, I'm going to open up a binary hexadecimal editor, and I'll show you just some functionality or some applications that can actually go through and actually find this information at that data level. Okay. So getting back to file slack, <clears throat> of course the operating system is saving things in 4,000 and typically 4,096 byte clusters. Okay. Of course it depends on the size and the, the addressing, but we're just going to use this for our example. I'm saving a 12 byte file. I'm writing 512 bytes from memory to my hard drive. OK, so it grabbed 500 bytes from my memory. And now that's a, that's a record on my hard drive. But the operating system is not going to go to the extra effort and write those seven extra sectors, OK? Because 4,096, OK, is eight sectors. I almost read 4,084 and said that was eight sectors. But, um, so it's going to leave seven sectors of data intact, although it is now technically assigned <coughs> to that file. Bless you. So again, whatever was written there in the past is going to remain on that hard drive. Again, little breadcrumbs of the user's activity. And you, we can go in and actually get this at a later date. Okay, so that is file slack. Okay, RAM slack of course, is that saving it, and it's, it's grabbing that 500 extra bytes and writing it. Now, the drive slack, okay? Um, drive slack is the space that exists from the end of the last use sector assigned to a file to the end of the last cluster. Every file will have some slack because it's very rare. I'm sure some files, somewhere out there, a file maps to that 4,096 byte boundary, but, it, you know, it's very rare. So every file we write is going to have some slack to it, um, and that's going to exist. And then, of course, I can talk about the disk slack. 
which is the total amount of file slack in a storage device. So if I look at every file out there, of course, they're not, not ending on that 4,096 boundary, so they're all wasting space. Okay? Waste is, is, a, is just a fact of life here. Is it an issue? With today's addressing, 64-bit addressing, keeping cluster size at least manageable, and just the sheer volume of the storage, you know, two terabyte drive, no, is a few megabytes of, of drive slack or disk slack, does it merit our attention? Not really, except from a forensic standpoint, we'll look at that in a minute. Um, it, it used to impact us. Back when we had limited drive sizes or storage spaces, of course, yes, we would partition our hard drive to cut down on the size of the cluster to decrease the amount of slack in our, in our disk system. Okay, files and file formats. Every file has a format. Okay? And if we really want to understand what's going on, we need to research, we need to understand file formats. Now, typically a file will be composed of both data and metadata. Metadata is data about the data. We're going to see that Microsoft Word has a lot. Whereas a simple text file, there's really no metadata available. Uh, it, there's no need for it. Other files, you know, JPEGs, MP3s, we talk about, you know, especially MP3s, we talk about containers because there is actually a, a great deal of metadata. Um, so again, what I'm about to show you is really just, just to pique your interest, um, to research and understand file formats. Um, again, from a classification standpoint, we, with respect to file formats, there are proprietary or free file formats. So we can look at, you know, dot .doc, Microsoft's dot .doc, or a rich text formats, dot, dot .rtf, or open document type, ODT. These are free and, and open. Uh, certain formats are not open. We look at digital rights management. Um, the movie company does not want us knowing the format of the, the movies they're encoding on the DVDs because they don't want us ripping them. Of course, there is DVD ripping software out there, um, so it takes place anyway. And there's an industry to actually rip this. So let's close this. If I can find my cursor. Don't save. Ah, who cares? Save. Um, what I'm about to open here, I'm about to open a binary hexadecimal editor. Um, and this is WinHex, and it's actually part of the X-Way Forensics, Forensics Toolkit, which allows anyone who has it to look at a hard drive or even RAM at the data level, at the byte level. Okay? It is activated. I do have a USB drive here, and we introduced in this chapter that USB drives go beyond just having data. They can be used for security, and that's what this is doing. Um, so before I get there, though, let's take a look at this. TextPad Forensics Test File. I'll open it. Uh, I didn't want to open it in Excel. Um, I did want to open it with, say, TextPad, a text editor. Okay. So here's my Forensics Test File. I did know that. Um, and what do I see here? 19 characters. Okay. Count that. Of course, the spaces are characters. And if I take a look at it at the within my explorer here, it tells me, oh, let's see if I can expand this. If I can control my mouse on this external monitor, it's telling me it's stored as one kilobyte. Okay? Do we believe that? Probably not. Okay? So if I open up properties, I see there it is 19 bytes, okay? So, and that's all I saw was 19 bytes. So the format of a text file is just that, raw text. Size on disk, 4,096 bytes. Can someone tell me what is my cluster size in sectors? 4,096 bytes, but how many sectors in that cluster? Size on disk, minimum addressable size of the cluster, 4,096. Well, how many bytes in a sector? 512, okay? Divide 4,096 by 512. Eight sectors to, cluster, to a cluster on this system, Windows 7 
And I'm, you know, the, in a virtual machine, it probably, I think it has about 80 to 100 gigabytes. I'm not even sure what I allocated to it. And I had to allocate it 80 gigabytes because I have Microsoft Office installed. Otherwise, it would be much less. Um, okay, so we look at that. Let's look at MS Word forensics test. And this, of course, has, well, not of course, but has even fewer characters. Forensics test. Okay, and I'll close it. And we don't, we don't see anything else, right? I feel like a mag magician here. Nothing, nothing up my sleeve here. But well, I'll show you why in a minute, why I just said that. Um, <clears throat> now, it says it's 24 kilobytes for those, I don't know how many, 13 characters. Um, so let's look at the properties. And I can see that it's actually being stored in the actual size, 24,000. So there's a lot of metadata. There's just a lot of Word, Microsoft Word junk, okay, to store those 13 characters. What's that? <clears throat> well, the extension identifies, should we believe it, the file format. But in the operating system, of course, it also creates a, an association because what did I do? I double-clicked on Microsoft Word Forensics Test, Microsoft Word opened, and then it loaded the operating system and loaded the um, Forensics Test file here. Okay? So here we go. Um, I'm going to open my binary hexadecimal editor. Um, and there are a few. There are some free ones out there. Um, in fact, this is a free one right here, Hex Editor Neo. Um, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to open with administrative privileges. Obviously, we're seeing it's unreadable from the user's perspective. Um, so let me try again. Run as administrator. Okay. No, I don't care about test gen. Come on. Oh, my Lord. There it is. Okay. There we go, finally. Okay, now no. What happened here is that this binary hexadecimal editor took a snapshot of my hard drive. Now, television show, um, crime shows, television crime shows have gotten much better. But it's, it's you know, it always used to amuse me. You'd see, you know, digital forensics on whatever on TV in the movies. And they would get to a computer. And immediately they'd sit down and they'd just start typing things, you know? Oh, let's see what's here. That's the last thing you should do, okay? In true digital forensics, computer forensics, when you find a computer, you do not touch it. If it's on, you leave it on. If it's off, you leave it off. You do not touch a single key. What actually has to take place is you need to come in and take an image of the hard drive, a digital image, okay, one-to-one. -one. Then you'll take an MD5 hash, and we're going to look at that probably in a couple of weeks when we start downloading things and checking the, the MD5 hash. So you take a digital fingerprint of both drives, and of course make sure that they're the same. <clears throat> because what you do then is then you do all your investigation off the image. So in a court of law, you can go and say, here's the original computer, here's the MD5 hash. Here's the image we took, here's the MD5 hash, and we did all of the investigation off of the image. Because if you touch that computer, just by pressing a key, you've changed it, you've broken the chain of evidence, and, and it's essentially inadmissible in court. So every time you see a TV show, and they go to a crime scene, and there's a computer there, if you see them even sit down, press a key, it is wrong. So how do they it? Through what, what I'm doing here is through digital forensic type thing. Now, you do need to document that this is the date and time that I'm taking the image. So you're recording every step and, you know, essentially under, under oath that these are the steps you follow with a witness and this is how you proceeded. When you take that, um, this image of the drive, mm -hmm. are you, like, taking the drive now and mm. taking it that way? No, no, you can just take a digital image and put it on a storage device. And then a lot of the work done today is through virtual machines. But virtual machines, there are some cer certain flaws to them, and, and I'll address that later. But um, So what we're looking at here at the screen here is I took a snapshot of the system 
my office right before I came over the, to the lecture center here. Um, and I'm, we're just going to work off this. I'm not going to take a new snapshot, so we'll just work off this. Um, so here we go. Um, and now you're looking at the contents of my hard drive. Now, I'm going to say this three times. If you go out and get a binary hexadecimal editor, don't save. Don't save, don't save, don't save. I took a snapshot using this program, right. Okay, because if you make a change and save it, you can corrupt your system like that. Take a look. Memory location 0, 1, 2, what is it, 3? What do we have here? What are we, what are we looking at? NTFS. What is NTFS? Okay, the file system for Windows 7. We're looking at the master boot record. Okay, recall what we learned with the boot sequence. Okay, now if I were to change this, okay, just change that. Type a one in, hit save. My entire system is now corrupt. Now, some people take advantage of this. Okay. It is not hard to do this. I could very easily do this to someone's drive and at the same, in the same breath tell them, you caught a virus, you need to pay me $100 and I'll go back in and fix this. Okay? Well, but you, that's right. Exactly. There we go. One. I just corrected this thing. Um, now, actually, I would have to look at the master boot record and make sure that I actually did corrupt it. If I put a one by that end, I definitely corrupted it. Um, Right. So if I did that, and, and of course by putting the one there, you can see that I updated the, the memory address. So, but I'm not going to save. Again, don't save. So this happens. You know, you just change one or two things. You pay me. I'll go back in. Yeah, I'll take that one out of there. And maybe and maybe set something so it happens on a recurring basis. You know, so you have to contact oh, me so again. There we go. That's right. <laughs> okay. So now let's take a look. Let me scroll down here back into that forensics directory. And let's look at the textpad forensics file. So there it is. Forensics test file. OK, we saw that. And that's it, 19 bytes. And what a binary hexadecimal editor allows me to do, of course, is I can look. The capital F is actually ASCII code 46. Lowercase o is ASCII code 6F. And I can edit in either case. I could go over here and edit this, too, and type something in. OK? You know, FF, whatever. And I now change that character to that Y. And anybody know what that Y is in like Dutch or whatever that is there? Um, so I'm not sure. Um, actually, it's just a, a computer character. Let's go back to Drive C because now it gets interesting. Let's look at MS Word forensics test. Okay. Yes. Here's here is the 24 kilobytes Microsoft uses to record that this file says forensics test. And I'll scroll down. So this is all metadata. And somewhere down here, somewhere way down here, bottom of the ocean, there it is. You'd have to ask Microsoft. Um, other formats don't require this much. Now, of course, others, others are worse, PDF. Um, so take a look at this, though. Here's my forensics test, OK? There's my ASCII 46, you know, 6F, all the way down. T, 74, OD. Does anybody know what that is? And really, you won't get, this, get to this until further on in programming in logic one. End of file. Yep, or end of line, yes. Uh, actually, that's end of file. Um, in programming logic one, you will read from a file, and you'll put it into a loop. While not, end of file, read. Do something like that. Um, so there's an extra character there, of course, that was not in the text file. Now, what does Microsoft Word, and many programs use the end of file character, it denotes the end of that usable information. And that's all we saw, right? Anything after the end of file character is not presented when you look at a Microsoft Word document. So if I scroll down, secret message. And of course, I opened up Microsoft Word, and nobody saw that secret message. OK, so here we go. Let me put the cursor here. Ah, I 
am a bad employee and I am communicating with my bad friends and oh, you can't backspace yes I'm a rep and we are going oh, can't see it sorry cannot write yep I know that right now I'm in a safe mode here scroll down come on why is it not scrolling ah that's right, exactly. <laughs> Cut me off. I'm not sure. My whole system. Oh, well. Um, I could start writing up here. I'm not sure why this is happening. But let me ask you. So what I was going to write there is I'm a bad employee. I'm communicating with my bad friends to take down the company's system. Okay? You're a system administrator. And you've been alerted to the fact that some of your employees are plotting to do something. Maybe you work for NSA, DOD, something like that. And they're communicating, they're sending Word documents back and forth. What are you going to do? You're going to open up the Word document? <laughs> Nothing happening here. It is something happening here. So again, from a forensic standpoint, we need to look beneath the hood. We need to understand everything that's going on. Now, let's take a look at something else. Hopefully I haven't just crashed my forensic system here. It doesn't look like it. Um, <laughs> you're right, save as, exactly. Um, let's take a look at this. Addy in blue, and I have a, I wrote an address reminder here. So this is just an image. Two dogs, my two dogs. Um, puppy blue is lying on Addy there. Um, and now blue is much bigger than Addy. And it's kind of funny. Um, but, and I should have chosen a, a better image, but I didn't. Um, but it's, 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 a, it's an image. Um, <clears throat> and you don't see anything untoward in it. Okay, nothing really conspicuous. Let's go back to my binary hexadecimal editor, and let's look at Addy in blue. Okay, so now this is a JPEG, and to, to, to modify this, of course, you'd really need to research what is the JPEG file format. <clears throat> and if I scroll down, hopefully it'll let me scroll. Oh, it's letting me. Okay, down to memory location F00, because I told myself that's where I was putting it. Well, I put it in a picture. And wait, do you hear what I have to? Okay, F00, I just wrote help. Okay? <clears throat> okay, using a binary hexadecimal editor. Okay. Now, I'm a terrorist. <laughs> and I want to coordinate with my terrorist buddies. I want to coordinate with my terrorist buddies around the world. I'm an eBay seller. In fact, I'm a power seller. I post to eBay all the time. And my terrorist buddies know that every Monday at 8 o'clock, I'm going to send them a message. Monday at 8 o'clock, I'm going to put up a pencil for sale for $10,000, whatever. And I'm going to hide a message inside the JPEG of it. Now, and it's, I'm not going to provide just clear text, too. I'm going to have some code book. So when I put some characters, you know, there's a, another translation. And then about a minute or two later, I'm going to take it down from eBay because I'm going to realize I did not mean to sell that pencil for $10,000. Okay, so it was, it was up for a blip, for an instant. When you think about the volume that eBay has, and, you know, especially if I, I'm using another level of, of encryption, okay, deciphering, um, it's probably not going to be caught, okay? I have a mechanism just using eBay to upload and download and coordinate activities with all my terrorist buddies around the world. Yeah. Have you thought about this a little too much? Yeah. What I wanted to drive home is if you didn't understand this, you'd be completely unaware that it's possible. Okay? And have I thought about it? They're organized crime. They're thinking about it. Terrorists are thinking about far more than I am, you know. This is just a computer science professor that, like, I can do this like that, you know. Um, terrorists, could they pay a computer science professor, you know, with far more knowledge than me, yeah, and actually actually work on it for a couple weeks, you know, not 15 minutes before class a year ago. Um, that's that's the state. So, what I again, what I really wanted to drive home was just to pique your curiosity. 
so that you continue to research. What does it require? I have to know hardware. I have to know operating systems. I have to understand file formats. We have to think security from the, from the first moment that we do anything in IT. So that's all I have. Binary hexadecimal editors are out there. Feel free to grab one. Again, if you grab one, don't save. Um, don't save. What? Don't save. Don't save. <laughs> there are mechanisms I could save as, OK, you know, and rename it or something. Never work down at the, you know, in operating system files. Stay away from those. Um, so if you're on Linux, you know, stay away from that bin directory. Um, but again, everything is just, you know, contiguous. So, so just be careful out there, too. Yes. And yes. So suppose you do save it. How yep. would you fix it? Well, this is just a, a, one of my files, adiumblue.jpg. So I, I actually, this is the way I put the message in. I opened up my, up my hexadecimal editor. I went to a location where I'd remember what it is. What it did require, though, I did have to know the JPEG format, OK? Because I didn't want to, JPEG, of course, is a lossy compression mechanism. So if it sees a large area of black space, you know, it's not recording black, 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 black for each pixel, right? What is it doing? It's for these 100, 200 pixels, it's all black, OK? Um, so I actually had to stay away from that area because where the black dogs are, that was shortened considerably. Um, so I did have to know where I could add characters without it being changing the image. Okay, so I did have to know that. Again, getting back to the eBay, I could sell digital art. Okay, a picture of a you know digital art, a picture. Okay, if I change a red pixel to blue, no, it's part of the artwork. Who cares? Um, you know, whereas dogs, you're going to see if I change something, a recognizable image. Um, so that's how I did this. I opened up a binary hexadecimal editor. I went into the data file itself at the data level, changed it, and hit save. So for your, um, for your like, situation that you were saying, like a terrorism earlier, remember? Yep. On the other end, you're there deciphering the message that you have another editor. Simple, yep. You can even write a program to extract this stuff. Um, one of the things we're going to talk about shortly when we get to the web is the deep web. Often, sometimes call, people call it the dark web. You know, the web that we see, the web that people browse, is, is just scratching the surface of what the web actually is. You know, there's organized crime, there's government agency, there's organizational activity, um, of course, terrorism activity, all kinds of things that take place beneath the surface that everyone is just completely unaware of. Um, and this technology, and then again, for what organized crime and terrorists and governments, this is, this is child's play. But <laughs> it does at least alert you, or hopefully encourage you to look under the hood. That's all I have. Um, that's it. I told you it was going to be a short lecture, so um, have a great weekend. So have a safe. What's that? Do you want to save that? Oh, no, no save. Exit. Do you know what it is? Yeah, it has that. Demonstrate.